August 12, 2012. A local Egyptian journalist is speeding behind a convoy of military vehicles towards the Israeli border. Egyptian forces had struck a small hut, killing six and destroying what looked like an amateur explosives lab. Two of the corpses lie charred. This was a response for an attack a week earlier on a border checkpoint that killed 16 Egyptian soldiers. It drew the world's attention to the Sinai, Egypt's frontier with Israel and Gaza. No one claimed responsibility for that attack. Egypt pointed the finger at militant Islamists, and the United States and Israel blamed the lawlessness in the Sinai. President Mohamed Morsi vowed to take back control of the peninsula and sent in helicopters, troops, and tanks. It turned out that these dead men were not from the Sinai. But once again, the people who live here paid a heavy price. It's a few weeks after the border attack, and fault lines is heading to the North Sinai village of Mukata. Security forces had recently raided several homes, a mosque, and a school here. They arrested 10 people they claimed were extremists, among them Abdullah, a teacher. <laughs> Abdullah had just moved to the Sinai. He said security forces interrogated him about militant activity here. الأشياء لا تسألون عنها إن هي هل الناس اللي هنا بتشوفون بيبيعوا أسلحة طبعاً ما بشوفتش طب أنت بتروح تصلي في المسجد معهم طبعاً قلت أنا صليت مرة أو اثنين وثلاثة وما بس ما شوفتش منهم حاجة وخلاص على كده أنا صراحة ما عنديش خلفية لأن القرية أنا ما بشوفش فيها أي شيء. Fifteen-year-old Muhammad was also captured in the early morning raid. كنت أنا نايم أخذوني وأنا نايم وأخذونا بلبس النوم يعني وحطونا في ضرعة يعني ما سبناش نلبس سندل حتى رجلينا أنا شفت يعني كنا حركة خمسة وعشرين مضرعة الجيش بيعمل لهم طرق برا والشرطة بتهجم على البيوت بتا بتخذين الأهالي. What did they say to you when you were imprisoned? Did they explain why they were taking you? والله مش أخذونا كده هم مش حبسنا هناك ما سألونا عشان حاجة معينة يعني سألونا عن اسمي the day's events left the village shaken. Were you scared? The raids revived memories of the Mubarak regime. In 2004, a spate of deadly bombings at tourist resorts sparked a brutal crackdown here, which left a legacy of arrests, torture, and more bombings. Ostracized by the Egyptian state for decades, Mubarak's actions deepened the anger among Sinai's indigenous Bedouin population. When the country broke into revolt in January 2011, Sinai also rose up. But here, unlike the rest of Egypt, the revolution was armed. And law enforcement fled the peninsula. In places like El Arish, the largest city in the Sinai, the unrest continued long after Mubarak's fall. Police stations came under repeated fire. Since August, the punishments have gotten harsher.
We've come to meet the family of 25-year-old Ahmed Salem. He's on death row for an attack on a police station here that killed seven. Why don't you tell us a little bit about who Ahmed Salem is? So they're just showing me a video of what happened the moment when Ahmed received the death sentence. He's inside prison, behind bars, and he's saying that God is my witness and I'm innocent. Many of the men, from the very first day of their arrest in 2011 until the trial concluded in late 2012, consistently denied these allegations, denied any involvement in these attacks. Uh, of course, the, what happened in August of 2012 and the killings of Egyptian soldiers clearly had an impact on the outcome of the trial. The court accused the men of belonging to an extremist group called Tawheed Wal Jihad. There's still no evidence that an organization with that name exists, by the way. Many believe that it was security officials that in fact came up with that name. Ahmed's family said he was targeted only because of his conservative religious beliefs. Your son and the 13 others who were just given the death sentence the complaint claims that they were part of a banned underground militant group. Is this true? In recent years, the conservative Salafi form of Islam has found fertile ground here. As instability mounts, a growing chorus of voices is raising the alarm about an extreme variant of Salafism also taking root. The Sinai is a no man's land. It's a wild frontier. And uh, since Egypt is a sort of an absentee landlord in the Sinai, it avails uh, different uh, groups of uh, terrorists, especially Salafi jihadists, uh, to find safe haven in the Sinai, threaten the Israeli border. It's important that Sinai not become yet another place where Al-Qaeda or other international terrorists can find a haven. There are ungoverned spaces in Sinai that have been taken over by drug traffickers, armed smugglers, as well as jihadis. Al-Qaeda has proven itself very adaptive But the violence has largely been directed against remnants of the Egyptian police state. How exactly this fight is linked to transnational jihad remains unclear. It becomes very hard to know what is the reality. The best case in point is really the whole narrative of the spread of militant insurgency in the Sinai, the scope of which up until now uh, I don't think is clear to anyone. We visited the villages around Sheikh Zawayed. This area is frequently associated with radical Islamists. With the security operation in full swing, no one currently involved in the militancy would meet us. But one man who's a former militant agreed to an interview. <laughs> كما يقال إن القضية كلها منحصرة في أفراد ظلموا وهم الآن يخشون من سطوة الأمن وعودة القبضة الأمنية والشرطية مرة أخرى. Sheikh Hamdin Abu Faisal was imprisoned and tortured after the 2004 bombings. He now heads a Salafi group here. We met him at a makeshift courthouse where he solves disputes using Islamic law. The Sinai, he insisted, was neither lawless nor becoming a base for international jihadis to target Israel. 
وعندنا نحن الآن نفتقد الجهوية في كثير ممن يعني ينتسبون إلى الجهاد وما إلى ذلك. He told us the problem was exaggerated and people were taking statements issued on jihadi websites too seriously. إعلانات هي من قبل إعلانات المبوبة فقط دون حقيقة يعني محتوى أو جهة تتبناها أو تستطيع أن يعني تنافح عنها وتدافع عنها عيانا بيانا. تنظيمات الانترنت وليس تنظيمات سيناء. So are you saying there is no armed Islamist groups in Sinai? ما رأيناه وما لمسناه في الفترة في فترة بداية تولي الرئيس مرسي للحكم هو نفس الممارسات الأمنية القديمة للأسف الشديد التي تتسم أيضا بالتطرف على الجانب الآخر فبدلا أن يأتوا بالمياه والغذاء والطعام للبدو أخذوا ينزلون السلاح الثقيل في الصحراء ويطاردون به البدو هذا يزيد الاحتقان ويحول المنطقة إلى برميل بارود ممكن في لحظة من اللحظات ينفجر ونحن لا نريده أن ينفجر The absence of development is evident across North Sinai At a water pump these families were spending hours collecting as much clean water as they could carry فين التنمية هذا؟ أنت شايفة تنمية؟ فين التنمية؟ كل هنا بالجهود الزتية دلوقت الأهالي في شمال سيناء كل واحد بيعمر له ترمبر توازي أرض البير هذا بيكلف الاهالي فوق ال 50,000 مكلفات بجهود الذاتيه وقوم عامل له طرمب ما بتطلع مالحه احيانا باجي مثلا مع جركن بقعد ثلاث ساعات عشان املا جرك من زحمه الناس الحلوه ما فيش من مستمره بقى لها دلوقتي خمس اشهر نهائي ما فيش اي حاجه ولا في تغيير ولا في تحسن في البلد خالص يوم يوم كويسه يوم وحشه يوم كويسه يوم بس ازمه الناس ازمه الناس على الميه ازمه الناس كثيره خالص This is a very common sight in North Sinai long lines of cars waiting for gas every single day There's a fuel crisis across Egypt but people say it's worse here because much of the petrol is smuggled into Gaza Cairo's response has been to limit the supply of fuel into the Sinai. Tempers are frayed and people here are angry. We don't know what is the solution for this. President will change. Government not change as it is. Everything as it is before. Sinai's place between Egypt and Israel has been the curse. Um, the reason Sinai never really received any attention from the central government, any fair share of development funding, is its proximity to Israel. For decades, this was a battleground between Egypt and Israel. Israel occupied the Sinai for 15 years and it returned to Egyptian control only after the Camp David Accords. Since 1967, they've been going from Israeli occupation to what they now agree is, you know, Egyptian occupation, unfortunately. There are a lot of promises to the people of Sinai that, you know, now that Sinai is back to the Egyptian territories, there would be massive development. But with Sinai always viewed through a security lens, those promises of development failed to materialize. This remains one of the poorest regions of the country. Historically, the Bedouin here have been unable to own land or find jobs in the military or civil service. In retaliation, some have blocked highways, kidnapped tourists and foreign workers, and repeatedly attacked the pipeline carrying natural gas to Israel and Jordan. Actually, it is the state that is prompting illegality uh, just because you have uh, an overriding uh, sense of political and economic marginalization. In Rafah, a city straddling Egypt and Gaza, economic survival is pitted against international security concerns. 
When Hamas took control of the Gaza Strip in 2007, Israel blockaded the population. An underground network of tunnels proliferated and became vital for people on both sides. This tunnel used to carry construction material from Egypt into Gaza. It was destroyed by the Egyptian military a few days ago. It's a part of a large crackdown by Egypt on the tunnel economy here in the Sinai. When night falls here, the border comes alive. It's estimated the tunnel trade is worth over half a billion dollars a year. After dark here in Rafa, the back streets are filled with trucks loaded up with goods heading to the tunnels. The tunnel operators we met insisted they were only smuggling gravel, cement, and steel. But the United States claims otherwise. From a security perspective, of course, we know that the tunnels have been used to smuggle weapons. And we've seen repeated attempts, some successful, uh, to get weapons and militants in and out of Gaza to attack Israeli targets, including across the Sinai border. The identities of those responsible for the August border attack are still unknown. But some reports suggest they entered Egypt using the tunnels. Assalamu alaikum. Ustaz Mohammed. The smugglers feel they're being unduly punished. يعني احنا اسرائيل بتحدنا هنا على بعد حوالي 5 كيلو 6 كيلو بالكثير تمام شيخ موسى is one of the wealthiest men in this area where drug smuggling and even human trafficking into Israel are common Israel's new security fence is squeezing that illicit trade as for the tunnels to Gaza Hamas has its own set of rules اوه مشكلة كبيرة هنا اللي اللي حماس بتمسكه a big problem, but But Sheikh Musa seems to be tiring of the game and is on the lookout for an alternative. Sheikh Musa was just explaining that he'd really like the underground economy that's operating here to come out in the open. He thinks that would be a great thing for people who live in Sinai, but he doesn't think that's going to happen. Hamas officials had offered to shut down the tunnels in return for a free trade zone. But in September, the Egyptian government backed away from the plan. <laughs> أن يكون واصل المرحلة حلوة يعني أو فيها استقرار فيها. With the fate of the Sinai inextricably linked to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the world is watching to see what course President Morsi will take. In October, Morsi made his third visit to North Sinai and declared a new era of national integration. But many here still feel locked out. We are concerned with unemployment. We're trying to find ways to make people work and have a better career. We want them to own the land. So uh, I think uh, this government is very serious about giving Sinai a lot of priorities. But unless the government's economic priorities change dramatically, this may be a sign of what's to come. The Sinai cement factory is a relic of Mubarak-era cronyism, enriching a handful of insider businessmen, but with no real benefits for the people who live around it. Most of the employees here are from cities in the Nile Valley, where the profits return. Of the people you employ, what percentage are Bedouin? Yeah, 
لكن فتح فرص عمل للناس اللي عندها معدات يعني احنا عندنا مثلا في المحجر فوق ال 13 بلدوزر شغال من ابناء سينا. The Bedouin population here continues to be viewed with suspicion. بعد الثورة حصلت بعض ال يعني نقول مشاكل من بدو مجموعات من بدو مجموعات جديدة بدأت تظهر ان عشان ما فيش أمن وما فيش جيش وما فيش بوليس فبدأت بعض الناس تمارس بعض التصرفات اللي هي أصبحت فعلا بتعيق الإنتاج. مصر سوف تنعم بخيرات سيناء حينما تستثمر في الإنسان السيناوي المصري وتشركه في جميع القرارات وليس قرارات تصنع هناك وعلى السيناويين أن يتقبلوه هذا مرفوض تماما لن يحدث لن يتقبله الآخرين A group of activists and journalists we met in El Arish said Sinai's fate continued to be dictated from afar يعني نهوية التنمية الاقتصادية تحديدا هل هي ستلمس غالبية المواطنين أم لصالح فئة معينة من رجال الأعمال على النظام الحالي إن كان يريد أن يخاطب هذا المواطن باحترام أن يزيد أولا الغبن التاريخي الذي وقع على المواطنين لأبدأ صفحة جديدة مع هذا المواطن Egypt may have its first civilian president, but when it comes to key areas like the Sinai, the military establishment still calls the shots. Even though it's called the Sinai Development Agency, the purpose is really not development. The purpose is more surveillance, more control, more treatment of Sinai from this narrow security paradigm that has led to the state in which the people find themselves right now. Sinai is important internationally because of its unique geography. It's where Egypt, Gaza, and Israel all meet. So far, the approach to governance here has been security-driven. And it's been backed by the United States for 30 years with billions of dollars of military aid. And this paradigm needs to be really pushed aside and replaced with more of um, an economic and political inclusion paradigm which is not there. Controlling any instability here is crucial to both Egypt's alliance with the United States as well as the U.S. relationship with Israel. There is a, a bilateral U.S.-Egyptian relationship, but the reason why it's so important and why Egypt receives $1.3 billion is mainly because of the U.S.-Israeli relationship. As part of the Egyptian-brokered ceasefire between Hamas and Israel in November, President Morsi is expected to clamp down further on the arms trade through Sinai's tunnels. I am convinced that if more rockets are allowed to enter Gaza through the tunnels, that will certainly pave the way for more fighting again soon. A week after that ceasefire, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton spoke at a high-level forum on American-Israeli relations. Sinai was on the agenda. We are ready to help and to support Egyptian efforts to bring security and economic development to the Sinai. But after two years of uprisings and turmoil across the region, the long-standing calculus of security might soon backfire. The state, as it exists in Sinai, is only uh, a relic of oppression. Only the people of Sinai can defeat terrorism. The central government is not going to defeat terrorism. It's stoking terrorism through its practices.